In today's lab, we're going to talk about issues related to deep sea mining. This is building off of what we've already discussed in class, which is the idea of the increasing prominence and interest in mining so-called collecting so-called polymetallic nodules, what people sometimes refer to more commonly as manganese nodules, although the substances um, can be, uh, compri be comprised of a whole host of different um, metals and hydroxides. Um, uh, the driver of this, the driver of the interest, is we've, there's been a lot of interest for some time. We talked about uh, the uh, failed uh, CIA effort to raise the Russian submarine and uh, Howard Hughes using this as a front for, for why they wanted to spend all this time out at sea with, with deep sea capabilities, etc. But people have been interested in getting more of these metals uh, for some time, but currently issues related to the climate crisis really jump to the fore. And um, the conversation is being driven oftentimes in op-ed pages, et cetera, by people being interested in being able to produce more batteries and battery-related technologies for the electrification of our transportation fleet and other things. In response, the companies that are gearing up to do deep sea um, nodule mining um, are, are understanding that they need to address public concern. And so we're seeing more things like this, um, which is from a, a recent web page from the metals company where they've proposed this sort of hat or container or bag thing over the benthos that will, um, for example, minimize some of the sediment disruption and impact to nearby areas. So um, uh, the debate is, not, is no longer about just should we mine, should we not mine. It, it's becoming more... Um, we need these materials to do our cleaner transition, um, at least rhetorically, that's how it's being addressed. Now, what we've talked about so far is the Silawara One uh, project, and, and most of the, the projects that sort of started spinning up in the late 90s related to deep sea mining were like this in Papua New Guinea. These projects uh, and these areas that are being mined, or at least targeted for mining, as you can see here um, in, the, um, in the colors, um, were primarily in territorial waters. So near ports where they could get in, relatively shallow, et cetera. That was then, this is now. So now the big uh, catchphrase is beyond boundaries of national jurisdiction. And um, we are talking about doing this not necessarily in uh, the two, within 200 nautical miles of a coastline, but rather out in the so-called open ocean or the high seas. Um, and one example of that is uh, the CCZ, the, this Clipperton zone, um, which we'll talk about in a second. But, but given that we've migrate, we're, we're migrating from territorial waters to the open sea, the entity that's most uh, high profile here is the International Seabed Authority. And so this is an arm of uh, related to the United Nations Law of the Sea or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, we've not talked about this yet in class, but uh, we will. Suffice it to say, this is an append. This is a consequence of the Law of the Sea, which was fully ratified um, by enough countries to go into effect in 1994. Um, very soon thereafter, the International Seabed Authority came on, um, which is an independent entity, but it's strongly associated with the United Nations. And this is where all the parties that have signed on to the Law of the Sea Treaty. Um, agreed to abide by um, the, the jurisdiction of the International Seabed Authority. Currently, as of this morning, there's 167 members of the, uh, of, that have signed the treaty, so are therefore members of the International Seabed Authority. The United States of America is not one, even though we were the main driver to get the, the law of the sea going in the first place. More about that later, but suffice it to say, um, our official government position is that we quote unquote, abide by the, the conventions of the law of the sea, but we're, we just haven't um, approved the treaty. Um, that's that's uh, a bit of a silly thing to say. Um, we, we, it it uh, has not been brought forth to the Senate to ratify because the general assumption is that certain political wings in, in the United States do not want to sign on to multilateral agreements. And so therefore, if we, if we tried to pass it, it would, the, the treaty would not be passed and not be ratified. So the International Seabed Authority is the entity that, that, that helps mitigate 
um, problems related to this, helps try to maximize just outcomes, fair outcomes, equitable outcomes, minimize impacts. The colored area, the blue area here, is all the area of the benthos of the world ocean that the International Seabed Authority um, has jurisdiction over, according to the signatories of the Law of the Sea Treaty. And um, uh, that's, that's a bit more than half. It's about 54% of the bottom of the ocean. So it's a large chunk of planet Earth um, is covered by the ISA. Um, now, we are going to focus on uh, one section, um, the clarion Clipperton zone, or the CCZ, as it's often referred to. And this is this area that runs from um, basically a bit south of Hawaii, near the, Kir the Kiribati Islands, uh, uh, all the way over to um, uh, basically this trench near Central America, near Mexico. This is an area that's, that's relatively elongated. It's all pretty much between about 3 and 10 degrees uh, latitude, north latitude. Um, and what we see here is all these little polygons, these are all different territorial claims. So if you were to read this, this figure here, you'll see it's, that it includes places like the Cook Islands, sort of nearby, China, far away, Japan, far away, um, Nauru, uh, you know, still far away. Um, where else do we have in here? Russian Federation, right? Tonga. So um, because this is international waters, people can claim whatever. The mechanism of the ISA is what is bringing some structure and order to this. And in addition, you'll see we have some of these areas here that are designated as areas of particular environmental interest. So maybe a researcher did some samples there and said, oh, hey, there's some species that are particularly sensitive here, or there's a structure here we don't want to damage, or something of that nature. And so this is um, at least some evidence, at least early on, that the, the ISA does have some effect so we see people claiming that they want to do mining here, but it's not gone into this uh, a sensitive zone, for example. Um, but but this, is the, this is the CCZ. Um, this is a little video uh, just showing what it looks like when we're out there doing work and, and out there doing um, uh, sampling. I'll just say that these vessels are very expensive. I do not currently work on oceanographic going vessels, but when I used to, we were on a relatively cheap vessel, a Norwegian icebreaker that was a bit over uh, about 200 foot long, um, and that was about $40,000 uh, a day to run that ship. So these larger um, vessels are even more expensive per day. So this is an expensive endeavor to go in and, and monitor stuff. So what these guys are showing here with this, um, this little raw video here, um, these folks are going out and they're sampling the bottom. We have a couple different ways we can sample the bottom. We can put a core down or we can put, as in this case, a big uh, scooper, a big claw. What they're going to do is they're going to put it on this boat. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drop down to the benthos, get to the bottom. It's going to claw and then they're going to suck it back up. And then we'll take a look and see, what, um, uh, and see what's inside. So these guys are putting it down, getting ready to drop it down. And then uh, the video will uh, play for a while. We'll just skip ahead. Um, and see what happens when they bring this uh, a trap back up. Okay, so these guys have brought the, uh, the, the grab sample up on board and they're gonna open it up. And when we first look at it, it's just gonna look like a bunch of water. But now we're gonna, then they're gonna go in, they're gonna drain this water off and you're gonna see, again, this is just a random grab of the bottom of the ocean here uh, about four kilometers down and you'll see that there is a huge number of nodules uh, in this sample right so that's a lot from just one random little grab um, a good amount of stuff so you you can see the real desire of the mining companies because this looks like they can get a lot of material out relatively uh, quickly um, and again this is, a ubiqui this is ubiquitous across this region, so they see dollar signs here. For our lab today, what we're going to do is we're going to... Now, historically, uh, our, our first uh, few labs here have been about uh, going and getting data, uh, querying data, pulling out data sets, um, and doing some visualization of that publicly available data. Today's lab is a little bit different. You, you're more than welcome to create some figures, create some quantitative figures if you want. But this is more about collecting evidence. And so here the key skill we're working on is building an articulate argument for uh, a particular position. 
So we'll start off by looking, just helping you get a sense of what's going on. In this case, we'll start off by looking at where we are exploring the deep sea. And through uh, Deep Sea Mining Watch's uh, web portal, what you're going to see is you're going to see transponder data from ships. These are these are uh, signals we uh, that the ships are constantly transmitting to know their location for safety. Um, we can get access to that, and this is this is an increasing resource for a lot of commercial vessels, uh, shipping vessels, oil exploration vessels, etc. Um, that really has come to the fore in the last 10, 20 years, um, and it's a, it's a huge resource. And so here you can look at this. You can use this uh, web interface to look at where uh, deep sea data collection is going on, how deep this stuff is happening, etc. Next, I want you to go to the Deep Sea Observation Network. This is a type of ocean observing system, or OOSE. Um, and uh, th these are increasingly popular, and they, um, they, they amalgamate, they pull together a lot of different data sources. This could be satellite data, this could be ship-based data, this could be glider-based data, this could be um, occasional data that you and I go out and collect. Maybe we go out and sample every day for a month, and, and so there could be some archival data in here as well. Everything from water temperature to chlorophyll levels, et cetera. And so this is, so play around with this website and have a look at the kind of data that we, we um, do have with regards to the regions of the deep sea. I'll just say here very briefly that um, patterns do exist and to remind everyone that while historically some people erroneously thought that the ocean was very homogeneous and not a lot of structure, there is a lot of structure. So in this case, we're talking about ophiroid diversity. Um, here, again, as we've talked about before, when we have these graphs, uh, this is low This is low value to high value. And we do that because we're talking about depth into the water. So this is depth down into the ocean. So this is the surface. This is down deep. Then on this axis here, this is area from the equator, zero latitude, towards the poles, in this case, southward. And what you can see here, without going into more detail, you know, what you can see is that there are some consistent patterns, right? So these patterns are... Um, we see in the case of this uh, uh, taxa, we see the greatest diversity shallow and um, uh, at the tropics, right? So there is structure here. It depends on which taxa we're talking about and, 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 and how we're parsing, parsing this. But the point is there is clear structure, repeatable structure that we see across the deep sea. Next thing to say is, as you look at these data sets, just, just as a, a reminder that um, we don't have uniform data collection. We tend to overly sample the areas near the coast because that's easy for us to get to, and that's where a lot of the interesting biology is in terms of fisheries and this and that. And so, so for a variety of reasons, we are not sampling everywhere equally, um, but that's okay. When we have enough samples, even though the ideal thing would be to have a gazillion samples at our specific site, we nevertheless can get uh, some sense of what the um, ecosystem is like, what the biological communities, et cetera, are like um, in these different regions of the ocean, uh, even though we sometimes have to merge data from, from multiple sites. Um, okay, so then, then the next part, so that first part was just what, what data exists out there, like gross environmental conditions and where are we working. The next thing is, um, let's ask, what data do we have on the biological resources of the deep? And so for here, you have two options. You can use the Ocean Biogeographic Information System and or the World Registry of Deep Sea Species. You could use one of these. You could use both. You could use other sources you find. But these are just uh, two that are relatively easy and relatively popular to use. And what I've done here in the background is I've gone to the Ocean Biogeographic Information System and typed in a kinoderm. And so one, ta one particular taxon. And what we see here is we see the samples that are showing up. And so in this case, we see a lot of these things coastal and, and, and near coastal and, and not as much elsewhere. But you can use these um, uh, repositories to start to get a sense of, hey, what's going on? For the purposes of our activity today, we're focused on the CCZ. So I want you to find an organism, actually you can find two, uh, uh, two taxa that exist somewhere in this CCZ region. Ideally, things that are relatively abundant here. But the criterion is there just has to be at least evidence of some uh, uh, of, this organ of this organism or these organisms um, existing in this region. As long as at least some are there, then you're okay and you can proceed to, to do the lab. But if, if there's no evidence of this organism showing up in the CCZ, let's not use it. 
And that's basically the lab today. So the first thing is you're going to uh, turn in a paragraph all in one unified PDF. You're going to turn in a paragraph saying what the particular concerns are of deep sea mining, generally speaking. That's just one paragraph. That's just a few sentences. You know, what, what's the big concern about this deep sea mining? Then you're going to um, name for me those taxon. Let me just make sure I'm clear. I would love for you to give me species, but you may not be able to find species. So it might be the level of genus. It might be the level of family, and that's okay. So I'm using the term taxon explicitly here, not species. So, um, so it, it's, you're free to choose. What I do want, though, is I want you to have two different types of taxon. So a lobster and a fish, a squid and a crab, you know, something of that nature. I don't want two, I don't want two crabs. I don't want two echinoderms. I don't want two squid, right? I want, want there to be some uh, a pretty decent taxonomic variation between your groups. And so as long as you have those, you're then going to tell me what your, your first taxon is and then give me, you know, a sentence or two, just general description about it. What, what does it look like? What does it do? An image of the organism. Again, make sure to reference the source of your image. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, one, two, three sentences about um, how it might be sensitive to or insensitive to deep sea mining. Uh, and do that for each of the organisms. And so uh, then the, big, the main thing, the main focus of this is, are you in support or are you in opposition to exploratory mining in the CCZ? To be clear, you can get full credit if you say, I support exploratory mining, you can get full credit if you say, I oppose exploratory mining. The key here is to build a solid, robust argument in one paragraph, right? So you need to have details in here, you need to have specifics, um, but you only have a paragraph or so. Um, and so we're focusing on what is the evidence? Are you making a strong case that your argument is well supported? That's what I'm going to be looking for. And that's the write-up. That's due um, uh, uh, as one unified PDF. Again, uh, overall, one paragraph, what's going on with the concerns about deep sea mining? Tell me about the organisms you've identified as, as candidates that can help you make this determination. And then you're going to make a, a tight, reasoned argument as to whether we should or should not do exploratory mining in the CCZ. With that, I'm looking forward to see what you guys write. And I uh, can't wait to see what, uh, what adventures you have in data exploration looking down deep.